after that. Well, if you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. So now that Jesus has been arrested, they arrested him at Gethsemane, what do they plan to do with Jesus? And we see in Matthew 26 and verse 57, it says, Then those who had seized Jesus, arrested Jesus, led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. So this brings us to the trial of Jesus, to the Jewish trial of Jesus before the religious leaders of Israel. There were actually three phases to this trial. Now, Matthew picks up with the second phase. Uh, When you want to have a comprehensive view of everything that happens in the life of Christ, you use all of the Gospels. And John's account tells us about the first phase of this trial. Uh, Jesus was brought before Annas. Annas was the former high priest, uh, but he didn't really get along with Rome that well, so Rome deposed him because he didn't do exactly what Rome told him to do. And then his sons became high priest, and then eventually his son-in-law, Caiaphas, was the high priest. Now, it's likely that Annas was the mastermind behind the plot to arrest Jesus and to eventually murder Jesus. If he didn't initiate this, if he didn't push for this to happen. It wasn't going to happen. So I see Annas as the one that kind of came up with all this scheme. We know that he had motive to murder Jesus. You recall earlier in Jesus' ministry at the beginning and then at the end when Jesus was in Jerusalem, he did what to the temple? He found that they had turned the temple into a, a, a place of merchandise, a place of ripping off God's people. And so Jesus went in and he cleaned house. And that, of course, um, took away from Annas's business because Annas was the one that was profiting and getting wealthy from all that was going on in the temple, selling and, and doing the you know, exchange of money and all that. So Annas had motive to do this. So Jesus is brought before Annas first to be questioned. And Annas questions Jesus about his teaching and his disciples. Now, imagine just for a minute, you are arrested And you are brought before a judge, and a judge begins asking you questions about your life, and he's poking around, finding ways that he can charge you of a crime. You say, that would be totally wrong. But that's exactly what's happening in this first phase of the trial, that they bring Jesus in, and they begin questioning Jesus about his teaching, about his disciples, and they're looking for Jesus to give them evidence so that they can charge him for a crime. That's totally wrong. It's illegal. They're looking for Jesus to incriminate himself. They're looking for Jesus to say something that will give them reason to charge him. So it begins with something that is very unjust. It begins with something that is wrong, and Jesus calls him on it. Jesus said, I taught every day openly. You asked the people that were there to hear me. So Jesus knows what his rights are, and Jesus is holding to his rights, and he's calling Annas on it. So Jesus is under no legal obligation to testify against himself. Now we come to the second phase of the Jewish trial, and that's where we pick up with this passage in Matthew chapter 26. I think another reason why they had Jesus go to Annas in the first phase of the trial was to give them time to call in the the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was the supreme court over all of Israel. It was comprised of 70, 71 people plus the high priest. And these were the leaders over Israel. These were the ones who were considered their judges, their elders. And so it gave them time to call in different ones. You have to understand that this took place in the middle of the night. So they're getting people out of bed. They didn't realize that Judas was going to betray Jesus that night. It, I mean, it was all like happening, you know, in motion. Uh, just As they were going, it was happening. And so they were waking people up saying, can you come for for this trial? They had to get a quorum of at least 23 judges, and they had to bring in witnesses. So they were going around, knocking on doors, getting people out of bed. And while they're doing all that, they're stalling, right, with Annas. Now, this is all happening, as I said, in the middle of the night, which is another reason why this was an illegal trial. 
the trials had to happen during the day. One source said that the trials could only occur after the morning sacrifice was made in the Jewish temple. The trials could not occur in secret, in private, in somebody's home. They had to occur in the temple precinct, in the hall of judgment. So we find that this second trial occurs at the home, at the palatial home of Caiaphas, the high priest. Now, in capital cases, proper procedure was to be followed. It was to begin with arguments for innocence, arguments for acquittal. Why this person who is being charged with this crime is innocent. So the trial began, began with this person, we assume, is innocent. And that's the way our jurisprudence, jurisprudence is made up, right? You are considered, what, guilty before innocent? No, you are considered innocent before guilty. And that, that was the way the Jewish legal system was made up. But notice, in this trial, they are assuming that Jesus is guilty, and they bring the prosecution to convict Jesus of guilt of this crime that he's going to be accused of. And there is no representation of Jesus, no legal defense, that he's innocent. And so this is totally illegal. We know that in the Jewish legal system, they had to have two witnesses who agreed on the day, on the time, on the manner of what happened. All the details have to line up. They have to agree with one another. There has to be two or three witnesses that agree. But notice that in this trial, they find at least two witnesses, but they don't agree. And, and these witnesses, they were to be questioned separately. But they had these witnesses together, like, can't you guys get your stories together? I mean, this is unheard of. And then when the witnesses came in, the judge was to say, now, do you realize that if we find that you give a false witness, if you make accusations against the accused that are found to be untrue, do you realize that the penalty that he will be charged of will be the same penalty that you will concur? But we don't find them doing that. Again, actually in verse 59, we find them looking for false witnesses. Now the chief priest and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. So it's not recorded that the Sanhedrin, that these judges were reminding these people, if you give false testimony, the penalty that this person is going to get you will get. We don't find them doing that. We find them looking for people who would testify wrongly about Jesus. So they were desperate to find these witnesses. In verse 60, but they found none, though many witnesses came forward. So they couldn't get him to agree. They, they came forward. At last, two came forward and said, this man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, have you no answer to make? He's saying this to Jesus. Was it, what is it that these men testify against you? Now, Mark's account in Mark chapter 14 says that the story of these two witnesses didn't even agree on all the points that they were accusing Jesus of. And maybe that's why at this point, in this phase of the trial, Caiaphas puts Jesus under oath. He realizes that the case against Jesus is collapsing that they really don't have anything on Jesus. They don't have witnesses that are credible enough. And so he said to Jesus, he puts him under oath, and in verse 63, he says, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. So he's on shaky ground here. Num number one, he is supposed to be the presiding judge. Have you ever seen in a court case, have you ever seen the judge become the prosecuting attorney? That would be illegal for the judge to do that. But that's exactly what Caiaphas is doing at this point. He is becoming the prosecuting attorney to convict Jesus of guilt. Now, Jesus at this point does not have to answer. In Jewish uh, law, you did not have to incriminate yourself. You, you could, that's what we say, I, I plead the fifth. You know, I'm not going to testify against myself. I'm not going to say anything that could be used against me. Jesus could say that here, and if Jesus said that here, he would go free. 
Or if Jesus gives the wrong answer and, and they don't have any guilt on Jesus, Jesus goes free. So Caiaphas is taking a huge gamble at this point. He is so desperate at this point. They've had all these witnesses come through, and none of them have really lined up. And the two that do, it's just not, it's not a sound one. And so he puts Jesus under oath. And now Jesus is bound to be truthful to the high priest. He cannot tell a lie to the high priest. That this would be a point where Jesus was tempted, because Jesus knows what's going to happen if they find him guilty. Jesus would have been tempted to lie here. But what does Jesus say? In verse 64, Jesus said to him, you have said so. Now, Mark's account, it's even more emphatic. Jesus said, I am. But Jesus puts it back on Caiaphas. Jesus says, you have professed my true identity. Jesus could have stopped right there, but notice he continues. But I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. So Jesus comments further. He explains the ramifications of what it means that he is the Christ. Notice he calls himself Son of Man. Son of Man. That was his term for the Messiah. And what Jesus does is he takes his most popular verse on the Messiah in Psalm 110, verse 1, and he ties Psalm 110, verse 1, with Daniel 7, 13, and he ties those two Messianic Old Testament prophecies together, and he says, I'm about in a short while to go to my Father in heaven, the power. And he says, I'm going to take my seat at his throne, and then one day I'm going to be coming back, and I will be your judge. You're my judge right now, but the tables are going to turn. I'm going to be exalted with my Father, and I'm going to come back to judge you. Well, you can imagine how that sat with them. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. So Caiaphas doesn't want anybody to look over this point. He is not supposed to tear his garments to show his sacredness before God, but he rips his garment, showing his grief, showing his mourning over what he's just heard, and he's distancing himself from Jesus. I don't agree with that. And he says, you have heard blasphemy. Now, to be convicted of blasphemy in a Jewish trial, you had to use God's name. Did, did Jesus use God's name? Look, look carefully. In verse 64, did Jesus use God's name? He did not use God's name. He referred to God as the what? As the power. He doesn't specifically use God's name because the Jews did not do that. They had reverence for the name of God, his holy name. And so Jesus wasn't guilty of blasphemy. This is Caiaphas' last chance to get Jesus convicted of guilt. And so he steps in now, not as the judge, but as the prosecutor, prosecuting his case that Jesus is guilty. This is his last chance to get a verdict. Another thing about Jewish trials is that the verdict was never announced at the same time as the trial. Right? We have that today when the jury is dismissed as soon as they can reach through the deliberation, a decision whether this person is innocent or guilty, they come back, and it could be the very same day. But in, in Jewish law, it had to be the next day. Couldn't be the same day with the verdict and the trial. Why? Because they wanted to give mercy time to work its way into the case. So the verdict waited till the next day, and it was given during the day. But notice, they don't wait till the next day. What do they do? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? In other words, a verdict right now, the pressure of the moment. Then they, they answered, he deserves death. Now, drop down to verse uh, 1 of chapter 27. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. So what do we have here? There we have the third phase of the trial. So the first phase took place under Annas while they waited to get a quorum and the witnesses together. The second phase we just studied 
it took place in the middle of the night, and they knew that they couldn't give a verdict in the middle of the night. They had to wait till day to give a verdict the next day. So the next day at, at daylight, just hours after, they give the third phase, and they say, okay, what is Jesus? They rubber stamp what they had just done hours before. Now notice in verse 67. Now these are their judges. These are the Supreme Court. Think of our Supreme Court justices. And I know we have, some of us have a hard time respecting some of our Supreme Court justices as of late. But these are their most respected men. Then they spit in his face, in the face of Jesus, and struck him. And some slapped him, saying, prophesy to us, you Christ. Who is it that struck you? You know, the law also said that when a person in a Jewish trial was convicted of guilt, that they could not be mistreated or disrespected or abused in any way. That that person, even though they're guilty, they have to be given respect. And notice how they treat Jesus. So obviously this is against their law. This is a mockery of a trial. There was, there was no justice. There was no following the law to protect the rights of the accused Jesus. So basically, life was not fair for Jesus at this point. Jesus is at the mercy of the ultimate council culture. All of this happened to fulfill Old Testament prophecy. Jesus did not once defend himself. Jesus did not once ask for a lawyer to defend him in court. Why? Why didn't Jesus speak up for himself? Why didn't he say to those that they found uh, two witnesses against him, why didn't he say, let me clarify that because you guys misunderstood what I said in the context. I did not mean that. And they did misunderstand Jesus. Go back with me to Isaiah. Isaiah 53. Jesus understood all the prophecies about him in the Old Testament that he had to fulfill as the Messiah. Notice in Isaiah 53, verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. He was oppressed in this illegal trial. He was oppressed and not receiving justice, not receiving honor. Yet he opened not his mouth. Jesus knew this prophecy, and Jesus shows, I am the true Messiah. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Now, Caiaphas question to Jesus should have been inadmissible in trial. As I said earlier, he presented himself at this point not as judge, but as a prosecuting attorney seeking a conviction. Jesus did, did not have to answer him. Jesus could have pled for his rights at this point. But Jesus is not going to hide his true identity. Mainly up to this point, there's really not too many people that know that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is their true king. He lets his disciples know that, but really he, he tells those people that he heals of miracles, don't announce to everybody who I am because they would misunderstand about the Messiah. But at this point, when Jesus is under pressure, you can imagine the stress you can, you can imagine the strain that Jesus was under mentally, emotionally at this point. It's like being in a den of lions. It's like being in a snake pit with rattlers. He knows they're all out to get him. He knows that there's no way out of this. And he doesn't cave. He, he, he doesn't falter very boldly. He says, I am this son of God. I am this Messiah. You know, when we are going through times of trials in our life, what do trials oftentimes do to us? Well, what does stress do to us? Do we think straight when we're under stress? We get headaches, we get anxiety, we get fearful, we begin to live in that dark place under the strain of that. It, it kind of brings out maybe things in our life that we wish people didn't know about the way we respond, maybe in anger or frustration or words that we say. We, we, we become that person that we don't want to be when we're under the stress and the strain of trials. But what, what do we see with Jesus? 
We see the perfect character of Jesus. We see one who is, who is faithful to God no matter what. He remains true. And even in the worst of trials, Jesus shows his true character. He is somebody that you can always look to to be there for you, to be faithful to you. When you go through times of stress and strain and you want to falter, you want to collapse, you want to give in to it all, you can look to Jesus and say, Jesus, I need you right now. Jesus, you were able to stand strong. Jesus, help me to stand strong. Opposite to that, we look at the religious leaders. These religious leaders were quite the opposite of Jesus. They allowed this illegal trial to take place. Some, so, someone has said that there are at least 14 points of illegality in this trial. Jesus received no justice, no fairness at all in this trial. They rushed to a guilty verdict. They, they know they're not supposed to give a guilty verdict. They, re they really should have waited until... Sunday to give the verdict. Why? Because they, they couldn't do it on a, a festival. The Passover was the next day. They couldn't do it on the Sabbath day, which was on Saturday. They really should have waited to give a verdict on Sunday for Jesus, but they rushed to judgment. They, they ignored their law. They say, we know what the law says. We know what legal procedure we must follow to have this a just trial. But they said, we're going to ignore that because we want to do what we want to do. And yet what we find in chapter 27 is Judas Iscariot comes back with the money and he tries to return this money to these religious leaders, to these same religious leaders. He says, I have betrayed an innocent person. He says, here, you take the money back. But they said, we can't put this money, this is blood money. we can't put this money into the temple treasury. Because it will defile the temple treasury. Well, they had just taken money out of the temple treasury to pay Judas to betray Jesus. And now they're saying, we can't use this money in the temple because that would defile it. We have to honor God. We have to follow God's law. So we'll take this money, I guess, and we'll buy some property so people who come to Jerusalem during a feast or move here and don't have family and die, they need a place to be buried, we'll take care of it that way. And we find them flip-flopping. We find them inconsistent. We find them, oh, when, when it suits us, we'll obey the law. But when we don't want to follow the law, we won't follow the law. We'll go against the law. And they're totally inconsistent at this point. Jesus is consistent. And they are inconsistent. I wonder, are we ever like that? Are we ever inconsistent in our lives? We know how God wants us to respond in our trial. We know how God wants us to live in our troubles and our temptations, but then we forget. Well, in this next section, we have another person who wasn't very consistent either. And we find the denial of Peter. We want to ask Peter the question, why didn't you identify yourself, Peter, as one of the Lord's disciples? Notice in verse 58, and Peter was following him at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. Now we jump over to verse 69. Now Peter was sitting outside of the courtyard, and a servant girl came up to him and said, You also were with Jesus, the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. And when he went out to the entrance, another girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you, too, are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Earlier when Jesus predicted that they would all, the disciples would all fall away, Peter objected. He said, I, I will never deny you 
Jesus. And he said, Peter, you're going to do it three times before the rooster crows in the morning. And Peter said, I will go to the death with you, Jesus. We know that Peter tried to save Jesus in the garden when they came to arrest him. Peter took out his sword and he took a swipe at one of the, 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 the servants of the, the high priest. He, he was upset that all the disciples were leaving. Jesus said, let, let them go. Let my disciples go. Let them go away. Peter should have listened to Jesus. He should have obeyed Jesus. He should have followed the disciples and left Jesus. But he didn't do that. He, he went to see what was going to happen to Jesus, and he put himself in the place of temptation. It wasn't like the religious leaders came and said, well, let's, let's go through the crowd out there in the courtyard of the high priest's home, and let's see if there's any of his followers out there lurking around trying to free Jesus from our trial. No, it was a servant girl. You're one of his, aren't you? It was a servant girl. It wasn't one of the guards. There was no threat here. But Peter must have feared, what's, what's going to happen to Jesus? I don't know, but it doesn't look good. What's going to happen to Jesus might happen to me if I associate with the Lord. You know, when Jesus was put on the spot, who are you? Are you the Son of God? Jesus didn't say, who, me? You got the wrong guy. I don't know why I'm here today. Oh, Jesus was faithful and Jesus was truthful. Yes, I am the Son of God. I am the Messiah. He was forthright and honest. Peter, you're so bold when you're with Jesus. Lord, I'll never deny you. Lord, I'll go to the death with you. But now that Peter is around the enemies of the Lord, even this little servant girl, Peter's a coward. He relied on his own strength. He relied on his flesh to be true to Jesus, to stand for Jesus when it really mattered. And he learned that your flesh will always let you down. You can't depend upon your flesh on your own strength. We see the second denial in verse 71. It's interesting. After Peter denies the Lord, he's, he's warming himself around the fire, and there's some other people around. He doesn't feel so good about himself anymore. So he goes over to the entrance to the courtyard. He goes over where, you know what, if they come after me, I can make a run for it and try and get away. Maybe I'll be safer over there. But then another servant girl saw him and said to the bystanders, didn't ask Peter directly, said it to the bystanders. So now he's feeling even more threatened, like they're going to gang up on me. And Peter fails to set the record straight. This time an even stronger language. He denies the Lord. He puts himself under a curse to, to, to hide his lying. He's saying, may bad things happen to me if I'm not telling you the truth. I don't know this man. Verse 74. He began to invert a curse on himself a third time. Now, some of the translations say that he began to curse Jesus. Peter, you, you would never curse Jesus, would you? Like say bad things about Jesus to say, I don't know who you're talking about, but that blankety blank, I wouldn't have anything to do with him. I mean, we, we can excuse you, Peter, if you deny the Lord once in weakness, but a second time? But a third time, Peter, for crying out loud. And Luke's account says at this point they took Jesus out of the trial and they took him to a holding place. And as he was passing through the courtyard, he looked at Peter and Peter could not even look at the Lord. He felt so ashamed. He felt so guilty. And he began to cry bitter tears. You know, Peter really did care about the Lord. He really did love the Lord. That's why he was there in the first place. What's going to happen to my Jesus? But because he trusted in himself, he failed. Now, we're sitting here today in this comfortable setting. We're saying, I would never do something like that. I would never, I would never deny Jesus. You say, oh, yeah? Oh, really? Have you never denied the Lord? I wonder, are there times when we do not fail to speak up for Jesus? Are there times when we fail to witness for Jesus? Are, are there times when something is being said that's totally wrong and we know what should be said and we're silent? 
You say, well, we live in a cancel culture today. People really can't speak their mind. You know, people can't really say the truth today because of our cancel culture. I mean, we've seen in the news where, where people have said things on social media, and they have not only been censored, cut off of social media, but they've been fired from their jobs because what they said did not conform to big tech thought police or the woke culture. You know, that, that's not acceptable anymore in our society. And our society is trying to muzzle us from speaking out the truth. You know, what if a Christian is not willing to identify with the local church and come to a worship service and gather with God's people? Doesn't the Bible say that we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is? And yet we have reason why we shouldn't come to church these days because we're living in a time of unprecedented health crisis. Well, I think for the most part, the danger of that has passed, at least for us living here in Marshall County. At least it would seem that way to me. And people who have gotten used to not coming to church anymore, maybe they watch it online and that's fine, but they're no longer coming to church. They're no longer gathering with God's people, identifying with the Lord. I belong to the Lord. I worship the Lord. Is that in not, not, in, not in and of itself denying the Lord? If we don't associate with God's people, if we don't identify with God's people in worship as a church, is that not denying the Lord? Well, what happens if we get to the place where our government takes away our First Amendment liberties of the freedom to assemble and worship according to the dictates of our conscience? And it says, this church is no longer approved. Our government does not sanction this kind of church. It's illegal to meet in that kind of church because they're not in conformity to the new standards of what's correct in our society. What's going to happen then to Christians? If we think that, you know, I can't come to church because I might endanger myself, and I can understand that for some people with underlying health issues, and with all the fear of the unknown with this COVID virus, I can understand why people would think that way and try and protect themselves. But once that's passed and those people no longer are coming back to church to identify with God's people, is that not in and of itself denying the Lord? We can't sit here in condemnation of Peter and think, I would never, I would never deny the Lord. We see from Peter that our flesh will let us down that we have to be strong in the Lord to be able to stand. Peter wasn't strong in the Lord. It's not till after the resurrection that the Holy Spirit is given to Peter that he's able to stand strong for Christ. You know, I wonder with Peter, every time he, he heard a, ro a rooster crow, he goes back to this memory. We all have triggers, don't we? We all have triggers from our past, of our failures, of our sins. And I wonder, when, when the rooster crowed for Peter and he remembered this, did he remember it and get discouraged? Or did he remember it and take hope? Because what did Jesus do for Peter? Jesus restored Peter. Jesus restored Peter back to relationship and back to ministry. And God wants to do that for us as well. Well, in the last story we're going to look at today, is the death of Judas. And here we want to ask Judas the question, why wasn't the return of the money enough to satisfy your guilty conscience? Notice in Matthew 27 and verse 3, Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said, what is that to us? See to it yourself. In other words, that's, it's your problem, not ours. And throwing down the money, the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and went and hanged himself. Now, this story is such a tragedy. Obviously, he cared about Jesus. He kept up with what was happening with Jesus through the trial. And when he learned that the religious leaders had found Jesus guilty and they were marching him off to Pilate, for the Roman trial, for the state trial, he knew that Jesus was headed to his death. And he felt the crushing weight of guilt that he had betrayed an innocent man. Now, 
See, he betrayed Jesus. Why would he have a conscience after he betrayed Jesus? It's possibly that when he betrayed Jesus, that he didn't think Jesus would go to his death. Maybe he thought they would never find this innocent man, this righteous man, guilty. There's no way they can find any dirt on Jesus. Or maybe he's thinking, when I betray Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, that's going to force Jesus' hand. And Jesus, at that point, instead of being arrested and taken into custody, Jesus is going to start the revolution, and Jesus is going to clean house, and he's going to be our king and our Messiah. So maybe Judas is thinking that way. I don't know. He's a very complicated man. But now he's betrayed Jesus, and he sees what's going to happen to Jesus, and he can't live with his guilt. So he returns to the religious leaders with his money. Maybe he can relieve his, his guilty conscience by returning the money. But they won't take it back. They say it's his problem, not theirs. So he throws the 30 pieces of silver there in the temple, there in the temple courtyard. He tries to absolve himself of the enormity of what he's done. He tries to make atonement for his sin with his own effort. But he finds it's never enough. And you can't live with yourself when you don't have forgiveness of sins. Even though Judas had a change of heart, even though he confessed his sin, even though he tried to make restitution for his sin, he found it wasn't enough. You know, it's never enough when you don't do it God's way. God has provided the sacrifice for sin. God has provided the shed blood to atone for our sin through his son, Jesus Christ. And that is enough with God to forgive our sins. But Judas didn't avail himself of that. And as a result, he didn't find forgiveness. He didn't find forgiveness to take the awful weight of guilt off of his heart. And he went and he hung himself. Such a sad story. You know, the devil makes us think that sinning is our best option. That it's in our best interest to sin. But then after we sin, we can't live with ourselves. The devil used Judas, and then what, when he got what he wanted from Judas to turn Jesus over to his enemies, then the devil just discarded Judas like he was trash, like he was trash. And Judas found that sin is never your sin. Sin is never your friend. It will not get you what you want in the end. It will leave you wishing you had never sinned and make you feel like it's too late. It's too late. God won't take me back. It's too late. God won't take me back is Satan's lie. That's not what God wants. Peter and Judas, they both sinned, though in different ways. But in the end, their outcome was different because one of them sought forgiveness and restitution with the Lord while the other didn't. One of them believed that God would take him back regardless of what he'd done. The other didn't. He thought it was too late. And I wonder which one of these will you and I be like? God is calling us to be like a Peter. To leave our failures behind and follow Christ and serve him. And when we do that, our life ends up glorifying God and bringing others to Christ. Will you be like that? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your son, Jesus, for his perfect character, for the illegal trial that he endured. Lord, we thank you that you were so faithful. Lord, you admitted to your true identity, even in front of your enemies. You did not fear what they would do. You feared only God. Oh, Lord, we're going to be tempted to deny you. We're going to be tempted not to be faithful to you. Lord, some of us are going to sin, and we're going to feel like Judas, that we can never be restored, that no matter what I do, it could never be enough. And Lord, that's why we have to look to you as our only hope. 
because you're the only one who can restore us. You're the only one who forgive us. And Lord, maybe there's somebody that has lost that hope. Oh Lord, I pray today that you would bring them back to yourself, that you would restore them. Lord, I pray that you would help them again to believe in you. That you are the God who forgives and you're the God who restores. Lord, we thank you that you meet us where we are. You don't want to leave us there, but you meet us where we are to take us where you want us to be. So Lord, help us to believe that. Lord, help us to put our trust in you. We pray this in your name, Lord. Amen.